OK, Year 12, as I said, we're just going to work through text two um, in this lesson, which is our prose fiction text. It is the novella, 13 Ways of Looking by Colm McCann. If you haven't read through this or listened to it um, in the audio version, then I suggest you, um, as I've said, do that because you'll get a, a greater sense of the text if indeed you've engaged with it. Um, you don't need to read the whole thing. You don't need to have thoroughly explored it um, to still take from it for Mod C, but it's a really good idea to have some grasp of what the text is about. It is a really interesting text. So I've got here, as you can see on the screen, just a summary in your booklet. I just wanna really quickly talk through some of this. Um, You've got a key quote there that I've, I've started with, but ultimately Wallace Stevens's poem that we've looked at already as a text for Mod C is obviously used by McCann in this text. Um, he uses it as the epigraphs in his chapters for the novella. So there's obviously 13 chapters or sections within this novella um, and each of them open with a stanza from Stevens's poem. So there, as I said to you in regards to that text, there is a close therefore reimagining and, and appropriation of the original poem, taking that further obviously to align with McCann's writing. As an overview, if you haven't read it in full, Peter Mendelssohn is our main character. He's an 82-year-old retired judge and he lives in a New York apartment. And we get that quite uh, early in the text. Um, he's entirely reliant upon his paid live-in carer. And what we get from McCann through his characterization of Mendelssohn is a real frustration and a bitterness um, in regards to his aging body. He early in the in the opening chapters refers to the fact that he's been put in a, in a diaper um, which as you can think through um, often elderly people lose control of their bodies as they age so certainly there is that frustration that return to childhood um, which is again part of the experiences of life here obviously his uh, early quotes are regarding his frustrations as I said but also these experiences that Mendelssohn has lived through. So we get through McCann's narration a lot of this um, reflecting back on Mendelssohn's past as a character and you get a really quick and beautiful representation of his life. So as it says there it stirs some of his memories of the past. You've got his childhood in Lithuania, He's he then moves as a child to Dublin and actually interestingly meets his wife as a child and you get this really great description of him as he's leaving Dublin as a child looking back on who will become his wife reflecting on the girl who lives next door that he's never actually spoken to but has seen so many times it's a really great image um, and obviously then his career as a, a distinguished judge in America um, very frustrated obviously as I've said with his physical limitations lots of isolation in this early part of the text um, you're getting a real inner monologue style which again is a really important element in this text um, and obviously his wife has passed away and so you get a lot of that kind of reflection in his early discussions through his characterization. He ventures out the whole day is is describing ultimately his trip to a restaurant down the street um, to meet his son for lunch. Um, that son is quite an interesting character in himself, Elliot. Um, so Mendelssohn is the old man who's going out on a very wintry, snowy day in New York City um, in the midst of a snowstorm. So Sally, his living carer, is walking him down the street and you get a great description of that experience. Um, and then he meets Elliot. Uh, a great description here of his son Elliot, the hedge fund man, political aspirant, well-known philanderer. So very disappointed kind of representation of his son, a man whose lack of charm and consideration for others is indicative through McCann's writing. They meet for lunch. What then obviously happens is um, Elliot is very distracted on his phone. Um, some of you I know in my classrooms are like that. 
very much distracted by the screen and he keeps getting interrupted in this lunch. There's a great frustration through Mendelssohn's narrative voice, again, that inner monologue. Um, and you get a great juxtaposition between the lines he speaks outwardly and the thoughts that he has inwardly regarding the situation with Elliot. Um, and obviously, Elliot, in the midst of that lunch, exp exposes himself as having an affair with his secretary, who he has then sacked. Um, and there's a whole legal kind of situation that's brewing in regards to Elliot's um, adultery. So ultimately then, as the story progresses through this narrative viewpoint, um, we find very quickly that Mendelssohn becomes the innocent victim of a violent crime. And it actually becomes revealed later through sort of not an overt um, situation, but as the detectives looking into this murder um, find out, it's connected to obviously Elliot's um, infidelity. It's obviously a revenge attack in some ways for the fact that Elliot has stood down this uh, previous secretary for having this relationship with her. So ultimately Mendelssohn is killed on the doorstep of the restaurant, um, attacked, and cleverly in this narrative what you get is very similar to the poem, you get multiple perspectives of this situation. So that whole narrative around Mendelssohn is interplayed with the detectives who are actually researching and trying to solve the crime of his death. So very early in the text, we note that Mendelssohn has died. So you kind of got these really clever and skillful time shifts by McCann. Um, the other thing that's really important here is everything has been watched through the cameras. So you get this great um, representation of the way that we are constantly being watched in the contemporary world. And that's why, obviously, talking last week about those images um, that we looked out of Kaczynski's, that whole notion that we are constantly under surveillance in the contemporary world and how that gives us a perspective of life, but it's a really limited perspective. And McCann gives us um, some really great insights. Uh, somewhat ironically, despite all the cameras that are positioned around this location, it's very difficult to see the actual murder of Mendelssohn. So that, that camera is skewed and you don't actually see and the detectives are trying to watch these hours and hours of footage um, but they can't actually get clear image and vision of the perpetrator. So there's this, this whole ambiguity, this whole uncertainty that pervades this, this story and this narrative. Um, it's a really, really well-crafted text and we expect that of McCann. We've looked at his letters. He's an accomplished writer. Um, he has this great ability to craft characters and, and craft his language to bring these situations to life. Um, and it's only a short text. It's, it's not a full novel, but you get such a richness in his character. Um, as it says there on the screen, just scrolling down a little bit, as a crafted character, Mendelssohn lives in the past, his wandering and failing mind and body desperately seeking to cling to his former life. And how common that is for us as humans. We're so often preoccupied with things that have happened in our past that we kind of become a little bit lost in the present at times or perhaps for you you're looking forward into the future of where you're going um, that you're missing the moment right now so he gets that really clever representation through these time shifts um, and the way that we're getting these different perspectives it's so so clever in the way that he blends the different perspectives through this text um, in the hands of the, the tech detectives rather it says the past never stops happening they dive backward where, with their spiral notepads into the early verses of their work. So you're getting this really clever extended metaphor through the text between writing and literature and the poet particularly, the experiences of a poet because obviously aligning with Wallace Stevens's text that he uses extensively in this, in this novel. Um, Obviously, McCann is, is paralleling the experiences of the detectives here. And as humans, we're trying to work out the pieces of the story. As responders, we're trying to come to an understanding of whose perspective we're hearing and, and how we're piecing it all together in our own mind. Um, and again, that's part of our experience as readers. It says there, just as a poem turns its reader into a accomplice, so too the detectives become accomplice to the murder. But unlike our poetry, we like our murders to be 
fully solved if, of course, it is a murder or poetry at all. So part of that ambiguity that we saw in the poem, part of that, um, I guess, interpretation that's very diverse in understanding what Stevens's poem was about, McCann links that here with his narrative in terms of he doesn't give us any clear certainty. Um, we're left to ponder and we're left to process and the ending of this particular text. I love the ending um, because again, it's just as we're about to hear a verdict on the supposed killer's um, court case. And just as we're about to have the jury deliver his verdict, the story ends. And the final line in that cryptic resonance that, that McCann leaves us pondering, like life, nothing is certain in the end. And he gives us this quote, the sky outside is an immense sheet of grey. There is no movement in the clouds at all. More cameras in the city than birds in the sky. So we're going to look very quickly at some elements of this text. Um, I'm just going to pause it and give you a bit of time to process what I've just gone through in regards to the text and then we'll look at some of the elements together. <laughs> 